Hello everyone, my name is Arushi and I will be giving a talk today entitled as Introduction to Genomics. So in the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be briefly covering the following topics with you all. And in addition to giving um, or gaining a solid understanding of genomics, these topics will also help you navigate the pharmacogenomics course more effectively. So let's get started. So uh, before uh, uh, before we delve into specifics, I want to uh, tell you that we will be addressing the what and why of genomics. So uh, let's get started with why genomics. Let's understand what is a genome. So uh, genome is a fancy word that refers to all your DNA in your uh, body. So from tomatoes to cats to all living organisms have their own genome. And each genome contains the information needed to build and maintain that organism throughout its life. So when we talk specifically about human genomics, uh, as we can see in a crowd that we look uh, really different, but we are 99.9% .9 identical or more. And this diversity is created by a small number of changes in the genome that is really remarkable, right? So despite the fact that we are 99.9% .9 identical, we can't help but wonder what is it that drives all these differences? Why is it that one person is tall while the other one is short? Why is it that someone has blue eyes whereas someone has brown eyes? Why does one person get to live to 100 years while the other person does not live to 100? What makes one person more susceptible to get a particular genetic disease while the other does not? So while many of these things we suspect are driven by our genomes, we want to understand that, right? So hence, uh, genomics uh, and understanding of genomes is very important. Another thing is one of the most basic things that how do cells do what they do and what role uh, do they have to play in genetic diseases? So our lives begin as one single cell that divides into many identical cells, then into an embryo and eventually into a fully developed human being. And we, re we really don't understand how uh, that entire process occurs. Moreover, the code in our cells determines how to make different types of cells, such as neurons or liver cells, which are, um, so let, neurons are complicated cells that do very different jobs from liver cells, right? Liver cells know that you they have to remove toxins from your body, while neurons know that they have to store memory. Yet each neuron in your body has the same genome as each liver cell. Although it has the same program, the same code somehow it's executing a different program in order to become a neuron as opposed to a liver or a skin cell let's say so uh, that is one area that we can uh, study by looking at genomes genetic diseases are another key area of genomic research now before we delve into specifics of each of these let's understand some basics so to understand what exactly a genome is we humans are made up of 37 approximately 37 trillion cells and in each of the cells, there is a nucleus which contains 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes. Now, 22 of these pairs are called as autosomes and they look the same in both males and females. The 23rd pair is the sex chromosome that differs between the male and the female. And within these pairs of chromosomes or within these chromosomes is your DNA pack. Now, if all the DNA from a single human cell was stretched out end to end, it would make a six foot long strand composed of six billion letter code as it contains 3.3 billion base pairs. Now it's hard to imagine that how much DNA can be packed into a cell small nucleus. So, so the secret of the entire genome lies in highly structured and tightly packaged nature of the human genome. So genome is nothing but the operating manual of your body, which contains the complete set of DNA, which in turn contains all the genetic instructions that are required for you to grow, develop and function. So now ge genomics is a re relatively newer field of biology, but um, in traditional biology, there was, there, there was traditional genetics that was used. So to differentiate genomics versus genetics, uh, we can say that genetics was a part of traditional biology where targeted studies of one or few genes was, was used and it uh, obviously led to a low throughput of data. Whereas genomes or genomic studies uh, means by looking uh, or by carrying out experiments that help you look at all the genes or 
thousands of genes in parallel and hence give rise to a high throughput of data now that was with respect to scope and technology and of course the technology has gotten better over 20, the past 20 to 30 years and hence we've been able to look at a uh, multiple number of genes at a, in a parallel fashion and in a lesser amount of time however with uh, the increasing scope and technology there also is a hard part to looking at uh, genetics versus genomics but what uh, gets generated at the end of it is an overwhelming amount of data uh, so we can actually look at multiple number of interesting things with the data but uh, since the data is so overwhelming it also accompanies uncertainty with the data and you require a lot of computational tools and uh, expertise to make sense of the data to look at the interesting questions that we want to ask so now coming to the what part of the genomics so uh, according to oxford dictionaries the definition of genomics is the branch of molecular biology that is concerned with the structure function evolution and mapping of genomes so when we look at structure and mapping of genomes what we are essentially asking are the following questions what is the dna sequence of the genome what are the genes in the genome what is the genome's 3d shape in the cell so to answer these questions let's look at the structure of dna in much more detail Day. DNA is made up of two linked strands that wind around each other to resemble a twisted ladder a shape that is known as double helix now each strand has a backbone made up of sugar and a phosphate so it is made up of alternating sugar deoxyribose and phosphate groups now attached to each sugar is one of these bases one of the four bases adenine um cytosine guanine or thymine so now the two strands are connected by chemical bonds between these two bases adenine bonds with thymine via two hydrogen bonds and cytosine binds with guanine via three hydrogen bonds now the sequence of bases along dna's backbone encodes biological information such as instructions for making a protein or an rna molecule which we'll see in the future slides so with respect to function after answering the first two parts that is structure and mapping let's look at function so when we look at function of genomics uh, what we are essentially wanting to know is what does all the dna in the genome do what genes interact with what other genes how does the cell know what dna is supposed to be turned on or off so to answer these questions we need to understand something known as central dogma so central dogma is a theory that was given by frederick sanger by which it says that dna is transcribed into an mrna a process via uh, transcription which is in a sense converted into a protein which is by a, a process known as translation and proteins are the ultimate effector of the action of a specific gene so the fundamental physical and functional units of inheritance are genes and each chromosome includes several genes now genes are particular sequences of bases that encodes instructions for all cell functions with the, with an estimated 20000 to 30000 odd genes representing around 2% of the human genome now until recently the remaining 98% of the human genome that does not code for any protein is primarily referred to as the junk dna so not all of the dna sequences in the gna uh, dna uh, in the gene sorry is used to make protein so following transcription and through the process of splicing introns are removed and the mature mrna is produced by uh, joining of the various exons and introns are non coding sections of a gene that we look in the further slides that are spliced out before the rna molecule is translated into protein so uh, to to understand this in more detail uh, let's understand that uh, we we have 23 pairs of chromosomes one each pair comes from uh, one of the parent so uh, the G DNA level consists of exons and introns. Exons are the coding regions of the gene uh, DNA, and introns are the non-coding regions of your DNA. So, uh, not all the DNA sequence in the gene is used to make the protein. So, following transcription and through a process of splicing, the introns are removed or spliced out, and the mature RNA is produced by joining of various exons. Now, there could be alternative splicing mechanisms that are 
uh, possible wherein not all exons also get coded in a transcript. That is a different uh, part altogether. But uh, once the RNA or the mature mRNA is formed, then uh, translation happens and the proteins get formed. So uh, there could be various uh, scenarios where there could be mutations or variations within the exons and that could lead to a defective protein which would in turn cause uh, or lead to the uh, formation of a defective protein which would be involved in a particular disease. Once we know the function of the human genome, next we have to understand uh, is that we also have to look at evolution. So with respect to evolution, we are answering the following questions that how did history shape our ethnicities and populations? What big, uh, what big events shaped our current genetics and what portions of the genome are conserved by evolution? So when we are talking about evolution of genomes, we are actually talking about how genomes themselves change over time and we usually uh, mean over ev what we usually mean over evolutionary time and those are very very long long time periods we know that from having sequenced the human genome uh, for the first time and now having sequenced many human individual genomes that all of us are nearly identical to one another so our genomes from generation to generation barely change at all and most of these changes are small random changes which uh, hardly have any effect but when we compare our genome to genomes of other creatures such as chimpanzees which are our closest relatives uh, that diverges us uh, that diverged from us approximately 6 million years ago and we can compare our genomes to genomes of much more distant things like uh, fruit flies or even bacteria and when we do that we discover that um, even though uh, to say we are very uh, distinct from them, but we share a surprising amount of sequence, right? So similarly, even with things as remote as uh, remote from us, such as bacteria, when we actually go to think about it, we are um, we are actually very very uh, different from bacteria. We do very different things, uh, but we what we share is that every living thing on the planet uses DNA as its basic code. So for that to be used, every living thing has to copy its DNA in order to make a copy of cells. So bacteria uses a similar mechanism to copy DNA as humans. So we find that those genes in bacteria are in those cases are similar to genes in humans. So that aspect is again, um, important uh, to be studied when we are looking at uh, genomics. So um, another definition of genomics that emphasizes not only by looking at the study of genomes themselves, but also a little bit about application uh, is where uh, we're looking at um, their application in medicine, pharmacy, agriculture, etc. So why we're interested in genomes at all, right? So there are many, many applications of genomics today and the list is growing rapidly as we get better and better at sequencing and as we discover more and more things that we can actually do with genome and it certainly includes me medicine to be uh, the major part of genomic research especially looking at genetic diseases or um, looking at pharmacogenomics wherein we look at uh, how we can employ these uh, research findings to go towards a field known as personalized medicine which you will be hearing more of in this course and uh, if you're not talking about human genomes, agriculture and other areas of science are also equally important when we're talking about um, looking at the applications of uh, genomic genomics data sets. So now let's look at what are allele genotypes and variants because these are few terms that we'll be often using in our future slides. So let's assume that uh, this is our reference genome and these are the two strands uh, or or the or the genome that has been uh, present in a child one is from the mother and the other is from the father so if we see at this particular position the reference is at t whereas in the child there is a uh, one allele which is t whereas one is a so the alternate allele is uh, a which is present in the heterozygous form because it is only present on uh, one uh, strand and not on both the strands whereas if we look at uh, this particular position where the reference is a g but both the strands of the child contain c which means that uh, this mutation is uh, present in the child in the homozygous form or in the one one form so when both um are in the wild type uh, uh, form of the 
फॉर्म ऑफ द म्यूटेशन दैट इज प्रेजेंट इन द रेफरेंस डी एन ए इट इज नोन एज जीरो जीरो और इट इज नोन एज होमोजाइगस फॉर द रेफरेंस अलील एंड इफ इट इज इन जीरो वन देन इट इज नोन एज हेट्रोजाइगस और वन जीरो इज ऑल्सो नोन एज हेट्रोजाइगस वेर एज वन 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 इज होमोजाइगस फॉर द ऑल्टरनेट अलील सो दीज आर द डिफरेंट जीनो टाइप्स दैट कैन बी प्रेजेंट इन एन इंडिविजुअल विद रिस्पेक्ट टू म्यूटेशन एंड दीज आर द अलील्स दैट आर प्रेजेंट वेर एज इन कॉन्टेक्ट ऑफ रेफरेंस वर्सेज द ऑल्टरनेट so genetic variation basically in humans uh, is is responsible for uh, the reason that we are unique from each other and is also the basis for evolution and disease in uh, the human ecosystem so if we go de- deeper into the types of variants there could be multiple types of variants it could be single nucleotide variants where there could be a single nucleotide change that would result um, in different types of mutations that we that we now see or there could be larger chunks of dna that would be either deleted inserted duplicated or translocated which belong to the class known as structural variants so in terms of single nucleotide variants let's look at the first panel where the mrna is read in the bases in the mrna are read in uh terms of 3 and uh, they, they that is known as a codon and each codon codes for a particular amino acid and then a stretch of amino acids then lead to the formation of a protein so in the first case cag codes for glutamine uh acc codes for proline and act codes for threonine so this is a normal panel that we are looking at now let's say that there is a single nucleotide mutation which results in C to A change in the second codon, so that would still result in the same amino acids to be formed. Hence, that's known as a silent mutation or a synonymous mutation, wherein the amino acid has not gotten changed. Whereas, if we look at the third panel, uh, the A to T change in the second codon leads to a formation of a different amino acid, uh, that is serine in cases of proline. So, this is known as a missense or a non-synonymous mutation, where an amino acid has been changed now uh, an insertion of a t would lead to a frame shift while reading so that would lead to again incorporation of three different amino acids in terms of the example that is shown here leading to a frame shift mutation again leading to a completely different protein that would get formed so uh, all these types of mutations are different types of uh, mutations that could be formed and uh, all of these could have various different levels of effects based on what each mutation causes is at the protein level so ultimately uh, the order of nucleotides in polynucleotide chains is what is going to provide us detail about uh, genetic and biochemical properties of the body right so it is therefore imperative for us to be able to infer or identify these certain sequences and how uh, how do we do this is what we use genome sequencing for so this brings us to how we we um, approach the issue of how to sequence dna over years so since the so just to uh, give you an analogy uh, let's say that we can read 10 bases a minute uh, so that means that we would be able to read 600 bases an hour so if we go by this speed it to read the entire dna that is present in our body to take us 9.5 years and that too without stopping so uh, is it feasible no is sequencing read is sequencing as simple as reading a book again no so then how do we approach this problem right so uh, what we exactly do uh, or what we can do is that we read smaller fragments and pieces of the genome and then assemble it back so this is the basis that we've been using in most of the sequencing technologies so um history of genomic data has come a long way from the 1950s wherein the dna double helix structure was discovered to now that thousands and uh, 10000s of genomes have been already sequenced by 2022 so um if we look at the actual timeline of dna sequencing dna sequencing began from uh, the dna structure being identified in 1953 from uh, 
by Watson and Crick based on the X-ray crystallographic uh, images from Rosalind Franklin. And since then, scientists have acquired the ability to sequence DNA in an accurate and reproducible manner. So for, for the first time, it began uh, by a scientist known as Fred, Dr. Frederick Sanger in 1977. And uh, it began with the advent of Sanger chain termination method. And now massive parallel sequencing has paved way for understanding the genomes much more easily and faster. So um, what we can actually look at is that there are uh, two different uh, ways that we can look at uh, the sequencing technologies that have evolved. First is to look at the generations of sequencing. So first generation sequencing, next generation sequencing, or the second generation of sequencing, and the third generation of sequencing. So the first generation of sequencing began from identifying of the DNA structure or from Sanger sequencing up to the completion of the Human Genome Project, which was around 2003. And since then, the advent of next generation sequencing has occurred from 2005 and now uh, since 2015 uh, the third generation of sequencing has occurred. The major difference is uh, that we were able to sequence 52,000 base pair of fragments in the first generation, whereas 50 to 500 base pair fragments are in the second generation and tens to KBs of fragments are in the third generation. So we can also now see that uh, the first and the second generation sequencing belong to something known as short read sequencing, whereas the third generation sequencing is now evolving to the long read uh, sequencing that has been shown here. Let's look at the first basic method of Sanger sequencing. So the Sanger sequencing method was developed by Dr. Frederick Sanger in 1977. It is also known as the chain termination method. So why is it known as chain termination method? Because chemical analogs of DNTPs that are deoxyribonucleotides, which are the monomers of DNA chains, are used in Sanger uh, chain termination technique. So the precision, robustness, ease of use, uh, though operating on the same principle as other techniques, that of obtaining all possible incremental length of sequences and tagging the eventual nucleotide, uh, led to the process of dideoxy chain termination or simply known as Sanger sequencing, being the most commonly uh, used technology to sequence DNA. So there are like three major steps that are involved in Sanger sequencing. The first is to use a DNA sequence to carry out the chain termination reaction in which the DNA sequence of interest is used uh, as a template and uh, for a special form of reaction, which is known as chain termination reaction, it involves uh, with a big difference as, like I already mentioned, that there is a modified nucleotide called as dideoxyribonucleotide or DDNT, NTP that is used. So under normal circumstances, DNA polymerase would add a DNTPs to a growing strand of DNA, catalyzing the formation of a phosphodiester bond, right? So, uh, but in this, what we do is we mix a low ratio of chain terminating DDNTPs with the usual DNTPs in the PCR reaction. So now since DDNTPs lack the 3' OH group necessary for the formation of phosphodiester bonds, extension ceases when DNA polymerase integrates uh, a DDNTP at random and millions to billions of oligonucleotide copies of DNA sequence of interest result from chain termination of PCR uh, terminated by 5' DDNTPs at random lengths. Um, now what we then do is separate separate uh, so once we have um obtain differently sized nucleotides in the second step, these chain terminated oligonucleotides are separated by using size, uh, by size using gel electrophoresis. And since all DNA fragments have the same charge per unit mass, only size can decide the speed at which the oligonucleotide moves. So the smaller a fragment as it moves through the gel, the less resistance it will feel and the faster it will travel, right? So as a consequence from the smallest to the largest, the oligonucleotides will be arranged, reading the gel from bottom to top. Now, during earlier times, the reaction for four different nucleotides was done in separate tubes. But what we have uh, just understood is that uh, the formation of a um, 
that was known as the manual sanger sequencing however now due due to the availability of fluorescently labeled ddntps this process is now been automated and all resultant oligonucleotides run in a single capillary gel electrophoresis and hence now it has been uh, termed as automated sanger uh, sequencing and the third uh, step is to eventually determine the dna sequence so uh, we then evaluate the sequence of the input dna hence the last step clearly involves reading the gel and since the dna polymerase only synthesizes dna from a given primer in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction only each terminal ddntp corresponds to a particular nucleotide in the original sequence therefore by reading the gel bands we can determine the 5 prime to 3 prime sequence of the original dna strand and in the automated uh, sequencing a chromatogram is generated in which each color indicates one of the four bases and specialized softwares are used uh, to uh, view the chromatogram and thus to obtain the sequence of uh, dna so now uh, before we understand the next generation of sequencing uh, there is one important uh, uh, breakthrough technology that was developed that is known as the pcr or the polymerase chain reaction which was developed in 1983 by dr carry mullis uh, in california and this has helped in advancing our knowledge about genes and genome to an extent that uh, we cannot even begin to imagine so it is a technique used for amplifying the dna of interest and and uh, to amplify a fragment of dna using pcr the dna sample is first uh, heated from room temperature to a uh, higher temperature let's say 95 degree celsius uh, where the two strands of dna denature or separate into two single strands uh, of dna pieces and uh, this is followed by generation of multiple copies of dna using an enzyme called as stack polymerase which uses the original strands as template now this method results in replication of the original dna with one old and one new strand of dna comprising of new molecules then each one of these double stranded dna uh, can be used to make two more new copies and so on and so forth so this entire process of denaturing and synthesizing new dna is repeated 30 to 40 times resulting in more than 1 billion exact copies of the original segment of dna so the entire pcr reaction uh, basically happens in three major steps the first is the de uh, denaturation step in which the double stranded templates are heated to temperatures of around 95 degree celsius to separate the two strands then comes the annealing step where short dna molecules called trimers are used to bind to the flanking regions of the target dna and the primers bind to dna template at a specific temperature which is known as the annealing temperature which is approximately 5 degrees below the melting temperature of the primer now then the extension uh, of the uh, primer uh, of the extension is where the temperature is increased to around 72 degree celsius and the dna polymerase extends the 3 prime uh, end of each primer along the strands of the dna and of the template dna and these steps are repeated cycled 25 to 35 times or let's say 40 times in order to generate exact copies of the target dna uh, exponentially so the whole pcr process is automated and can be completed in just few hours a thermocycler is the machine that is used to undergo a pcr reaction as it is programmed to change the reaction temperatures every few minutes to allow denaturing and synthesis of dna so uh, the this technique is very very important especially in cases where your starting amount is very low and uh, since most of the genomic sequencing technologies do lead to a loss in the sample so if your starting at material is low uh, pcr techniques and most of the library preparation steps involve uh, amplifying the dna uh, so pcr um, technique was a very very important technique that was uh used to basically uh, help or revolutionize the genomic space so uh, another area that uh, then came up after the advent of pcr was dna microarrays so, so traditionally microarrays are done where we uh, sort of try to compare a uh, healthy cell versus a pathological cells but nowadays uh, more genotyping based microarrays have been now come up where on a chip there are already 600000 to 700000 snps that are tagged onto the chips and you can do a genome wide uh, genotyping based on these uh, 
mutations or variations that are already typed on the chip using newer SNP genotyping arrays. And these have also now been uh, routinely used uh, in many, many, many uh, aspects of uh, genomics. Then uh, the major landmark uh, project that happened was the Human Genome Project, which spanned over two decades and there were more than $3 billion that were spent 13 years and hundreds of scientists across dozens of countries were involved to not only sequence the first human genome, but also genomes of bacteria, yeast, worm, fruit fly, mouse, etc. And Human Genome Project um, contains approximately 20 to 25,000 uh, genes and uh, the human genome was sequenced to 99.99% accuracy and it was two years ahead of its schedule and it resulted in identification of 3.7 million mapped human SNPs. What we also need to remember is that though it contained uh, uh, samples from a number of donors, it is not an exact match of one person's uh, human genome. Even though a consensus um, human reference genome sequence is uh, still identified. Now, when we look at the impact of human genome project, apart from the fact that it revealed the sequence of the entire human genome for the first time, the HGP also hugely impacted various uh, fields like biology and technology and medicine also. So firstly, the human genome sequence initiated systematic discovery and um, cataloging along with other essential elements such as non-coding, regulatory, RNA as a part list of uh, most of the human genes and by inference, most uh, human proteins, right? So knowing a complex biological system involves uh, understanding components on how they are related, their dynamics and how all of them contribute to the function. So this entire systems biology field was uh, something that was developed and which changed our approach to looking at biology and medicine. Uh, secondly, HGP also contributed to the advent of proteomics that a discipline that focuses on identification and quantification of protein that is distinct uh, in distinct biological compartments such as a uh, particular cell organelle or an particular organ or the blood. Again, facilitating um, the usage of multi-omics based approach to study genomes was something that started because of HGP. Third, it has also changed our understanding of evolution and migration. So questions of long-standing concern have now become approachable with consequences for biology and medicine. Uh, fourth, it has also um, in encouraged a sense of multidisciplinary approach wherein people from other fields such as computer science and technology could also look at genomes and try to understand biology as a lot of mathematical and computational approaches were developed, especially because uh, it led to an overwhelming amount of data to be generated. So, so HGP propagated the concept of making data uh, publicly accessible and immediately accessible to the public. Uh, for further big data and large science and bi biology was the it was uh, conceived because of HGP and it was applied because of HGP and it clearly showed that both strength and importance of the approach to deal with its combined biological and technological uh, objectives. So in the field of medicine, two uh, several major scientific initiatives have primarily been developed and uh, um, it has led to a deeper understanding of human genetic variation uh, in con con connect connection to the uh, human health and have been undertaken since the end of human genome project and now we can compare our sequence of interest with the reference genome. So HAPNAP project, 1000 genomes and various GVAS studies have then uh, started coming up uh, with the impact of HGP. And the goal of the HAPNAP project was to recognize haplotype blocks uh, of common single nucleotide polymorphisms in various population and uh, its successor, the 1000 genomes project an ongoing attempt to identify common and uncommon single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, that are present in multiple population uh, data sets and uh, smaller scale clinical GVAS that associate unique uh, genetic variants with disease risk of varying statistical significance based on case control um, comparisons have been supported uh, by data that have been provided by both these projects. So. Um, 
these are some impacts of uh, um, hgp which led to those two nature projects whereas jiva studies have also come up now if we look at post 2005 when hgp was completed there are close to about more than uh, 1350 publications that have now come up based on jiva studies and uh, the major problem that we encounter with jiva studies is that the results can be difficult to interpret because the actual disease causing variant might be rare and the sample size of the study might be too small or the disease phenotype might not be well stratified so uh, another issue that we come across in uh, jivas is that what fraction of the thousands of jivas hits are signal versus what fraction are noise is one more concern so now uh, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing in respect to next generation sequencing have now come up which have now paved way for understanding pharmacogenomics which essentially means and says that one drug does not fit all or what are the adverse drug reactions that are associated with a drug how can we understand these variations in much more detail and uh, go to the field that is now known as personalized medicine uh, can we now look at clinically actionable variants uh, can we then use uh, information that is present in our genome to develop newer drugs and therapies for various disorders for example cancer driving mutations and so on and so forth so the impact of hgp on medicine and other aspects of uh, uh, biology and technology has been huge so now uh, what exactly led to all these uh, things was the advent of the next generation sequencing so a uh, next generation sequencing um, is a technique that is uh, from the second generation of sequencing and it is uh, in this methodology uh the fluorescently labeled uh dntps or deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates are sequentially incorporated into a dna template uh, and in incorporated into a dna template strand um and this reaction is catalyzed by dna pol uh in a massively parallel manner so the nucleotides are detected by fluorophore excitation during each cycle and at the point of incorporation illumina sequencing technology is the most widely used and it works on the principle known as sequencing by synthesis chemistry uh, and this process pr produces more than 90% of the world sequencing data it offers high precision high error free read rates and a high percentage of base calls above q30 so there are four major uh, steps that are included in, in the illumina ngs workflow that as that is shown as on the slide so the first is the library preparation so by random fragmentation of the dna sample accompanied by adapter ligation the sequencing library is prepared now adapters are short sequences of nucleotides that are added to dna sample of interest now adapter ligated uh, fragments are then amplified by pcr and are also purified the second step is the hybridization and the clonal amplification which is also known as the cluster generation so the library is then loaded onto the flow cell for cluster generation where uh, fragments are captured on a lawn of surface bound oligonucleotides complementary to the library adapters now by bridge amplification each uh, uh by bridge amplification each fragment is then amplified into separate clonal clusters and the templates are ready for sequencing when the cluster generation is complete then eventually the third step is sequencing and sequencing by synthesis that is the illumina's sps technology uses a proprietary reversible terminator based process that detects single bases as they are incorporated into dna template strands and during each sequencing step all four reversible terminator bound uh, dna these are present and natural competition minimizes integration bias and dramatically decreases raw error rates the outcome is an highly accurate base by base sequencing that even with repeated sequence uh, regions and homopolymers practically removes sequence context specific errors now the fourth step is detection and data analysis so the newly identified sequence reads are processed and then matched to a, to a reference genome during data processing and alignment and after alignment to the reference sequence many reference uh, sorry many variants are detected for further analysis such as smps or indels and so on and so forth and with the advent of next generation sequencing the 
genome sequencing over the decade has massively increased from close to about none uh, human genomes that were sequenced annually in 1998 to close to about more than 18000 in 2014 alone and i'm sure the number has increased up to 2022 uh, and with the increased number of sequences that have been uh, generated the sequencing cost and data out so the sequencing cost has been reducing and the data output has been increasing with new Newer technologies, newer machines that have been now uh, being used in the genomic space. So, with so much of data, uh, there are some major challenges that we face. So, even after DNA isolation, library preparation, and sequencing, once you get your data and you bioinformatically process the data to get a variant file, there are more than hundred million genomic variants in humans. There are more than twenty thousand genes. so there are either too many variants and there are only few disease causing variants which would be clinically relevant so how do we now go and find a needle in the haystack if we are looking at pharmacogenomics then which is the clinically uh, pharmacogenomic level uh, variant that we are looking at if we are looking at genetic diseases how do we go to that one particular uh, variant that would you know solve or Uh, correlate the genotype with the phenotype that we are seeing in the patient. So basically, how do we find a needle in the haystack? Is the major challenge that we uh, face. So just to uh, br- give you a brief about the bioinformatic and um, process that happens once you get the BCL files or the image files that we get from sequencing, they are then converted into FASTQ files, which are the raw sequence files. And then, since we have added adapters and we look at quality of basis, we trim the FASTQ files or do a sort of QC steps on the FASTQ file, and then align our FASTQ file to the reference genome. We could use an HG19 or a HG38 uh, reference genome. We look at what are reference genomes in the further slides, and then what we get is an aligned binary file, which we then uh, Call for variants and call it as a VCF. That is a variant calling file, and then we identify that let's say at this particular position, G two C is our variant that is present in the file. So, uh, like I mentioned, that there are variants, right? So, uh, if we have to describe each variant, we now describe variants based on uh, their positions in the gene, right? So. Uh, the start codon uh, is where you label it as c.1 and let's say that this is a two exon gene so let's say that there are um, 36 bases in the exon one so we will start labeling it as c1 to c36 and then there is an intron spanning in between the exons so the se- first base of the second exon will begin from c37 and go up to c72 if there are 30 uh, 36 Bases present in exon two as well, right? Now, if we have to uh, denote any variation present in the intron, it will be relative to the closest exon. So, let's say if there is a variant that is ten bases downstream of the last uh, base in exon one, then this will be denoted as C thirty six plus ten. But if it is ten bases upstream or the closest uh, from the exon two. Then it will, since the first uh, base of exon two is C thirty seven, it will be known as C thirty seven minus ten because it's upstream of the exon two. So this is uh, how we do denote nucleotide positions within a gene. For further uh, details on understanding how each um, variation is also represented in UTR, please go and uh, visit our uh, lecture on understanding HGVS nomenclature, uh, which is being recorded and put up in the course of the clinical variant interpretation course uh, as a separate course on our channel. And you will find more details about uh, these uh, nucleotide positions. How do we label each nucleotide positions? So now that we know that there are nucleo- there are different ways of representing nucleotide positions within a gene. Why do we have to uh, know this? Is because uh, we cannot randomly go to let's say a place called um, Dhaka, right? Now Dhaka exists in Bihar as well as Bangladesh. So if I just say that I want to go to Dhaka, it makes no sense. I have to specify which country, which city, which street, and then eventually reach to the house. So similarly. 
our genome also we cannot just say that there is a variation present on position 100 we have to specify which chromosome which gene it belongs to what is the cdna or coding dna position and eventually tell what nucleotide has got changed to what nucleotide in the uh, genome right so that is the importance of the genomic address that we have to make sure while we represent variations or mutations. So there's a standard HGVS nomenclature that is used to report and exchange information regarding variants found in DNA, RNA, and protein sequences. And this serves as an international standard in genomic medicine. Now, HGVS nomenclature is authorized by Human Genome Variation Society, that is HGVS, uh, Human Varium Project, HVP, and Human Genome Organization, that is HUGO. So there's a standard HGVS format in which we first uh, mention the RefSec ID, followed by a colon, and then there is a sequence type, followed by a dot, and then followed by a position change. So this is the general uh, standard HGVS format. So every uh, variation has to be... Um, recorded or mentioned in this particular format so for example this is the nmid which is the coding um, id that coding sequence uh, id that we are using as the reference sequence and then that is followed by a colon then there is a c dot because we are referring to this coding uh, sequence and then this is the position in the uh, coding sequence that is at the 632nd position the nucleotide g has been converted to a so this is how we would represent a coding sequence variation. Now, reference sequences could be of multiple types. Like you could uh, you could denote the reference sequence at the chromosome level, wherein you would give it as an NCID. So you can remember chromosome with C. Uh, if you denote it at the coding potential, that is at the RNA level, then you look definitely call it as an NMID. If you talk about at the DNA level, then you call it at call it as the genomic DNA ID or the NGID. And then eventually if you uh, denote it at the protein level, you call it as call it as an NPID. Uh, only in cases of proteins we uh, use the three letter amino acid code to represent the uh, change in the amino acid that has happened. So these reference sequences also uh, have to come through data sources that provide stable um, results. That is, uh, we use naturally RefSec and Ensemble. And a sequence identifier must only ever identify one reference sequence. And the sequence referred uh, cannot be deleted or changed. And RefSec and Ensemble sequences use version numbers to distinguish between sequences. And hence, variant descriptions lacking a version number are not valid. So these are few things with respect to RefSec sequences that we need to remember. Then we also need to understand the concept of genome builds in understanding genomics. So uh, whenever we sequence a population or multiple uh, members of a population, the uh, genomes of each of the individuals are assembled to calculate allele frequencies where, wherein what is the allele frequency of a particular allele across the population. And whenever newer sequences keep getting added or keeps getting more and more sequenced, these allele frequencies are then updated. And uh, at the same time, these uh, sequences are also assembled to form something known as a population consensus genome. And additional genomes are also present uh, as and when they keep getting added in the assembled genomes. The population consensus genome keeps getting updated. So once we've understood the RefSec uh, uh, RefSec part of the HGVS nomenclature. The second part is the sequence type prefix. So based on the sequence type prefixes, there could be number of sequence type prefixes that you could use depending on what uh, sequence are you referring to. So if you're referring to the linear genomic reference sequence or the DNA sequence, you refer to it as the G dot position. If you're talking about the protein coding transcript or the RNA level, then you talk about it at the C dot level. If you're talking about mitochondrial reference, because you have a special circular genomic reference sequence, then you give it denoted via M dot position. And uh, if it is at an RNA level, you call it at uh, RNA reference sequence. If it is as, as a protein uh, level, then you call it at the P dot um, sequence type prefix. So, however, uh, protein, RNA, and other uh, sequence type prefixes exist, the recommended DNA reference is always going to be a genomic reference sequence. So, um, after all these um, 
concepts that we have looked at, the major points to remember is that all variants must be described at the DNA level when we talk about uh, understanding genomics or understanding variations. Intronic variants uh, need to be described with the NGID. The protein, RNA, and cDNA changes should always serve as add-ons in addition to genomic level change. Parenthesis should be added in protein changes to describe experimental validation and predicted NPIDs. And in terms of nonsense variation or in terms of stop codons, where uh, the mutation leads to a stop codon incorporation, TER or STAR is to be used. Uh, X is of usually used. You will see them in most of the publications, but it's not officially recommended by the HGBS nomenclature. So these are few points that we need to remember uh, when we are talking about uh, HGVS nomenclature. And uh, these were few of the concepts that would help you in navigating the uh, pharmacogenomics course better. So that's all from my side. And I hope this will help you in uh, your future upcoming sessions. And uh, uh, if there are any questions, we would be happy to help you. And thank you.